Hey, brothers and sisters, I'd like to welcome you to JCC's Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like and leave us a comment. I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all our mothers out there. We thank God for all our godly mothers, and may He continue to bless you in this year joyous day. I also want to thank all who left suggestions for additional content. We're asking again this week if you would please provide feedback on any extra content that you would like for us to provide. That can be Bible studies, word studies, anything that you want us to provide. And we'll take it before God and ask for his guidance on what we need to do and where we need to go from there next. Our lesson this week is coming from 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verses 1 through 10. And it's titled, Our Heavenly Dwelling. Have you ever longed for something so bad? I mean, you really wanted it so bad that you could taste it or you could see it yourself having it. Paul today in our lesson longs for dwelling with God for eternity. It was the driving force that kept him going. And as we dive into our lesson today, he has suffered for his faith multiple times, but he wanted nothing more to be with God in the heavenly realm. Let's get into the lesson and see what it has to offer us today. Our first outline is longing for immorality. And let's just read verse 1. For we know that if our heavenly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. From this verse, Paul is letting the church know, as believers, our hope is we face death, is that we could be with God. We want to be with God no matter what. So in question one, what does Paul mean by our earthly tabernacle? Our earthly tabernacle is our heavenly body. Paul is using a metaphor to illustrate that just as a tent is a temporary dwelling place that is not built to last forever, so are our bodies as we live here now. They're not built to last forever. There will come a day where we will put down this earthen tabernacle and put on our heavenly tabernacle. Paul says we have an eternal place that is not built by man's hands, and that's the place that we seek as children of God. Question 2 says, what does it mean that our bodies will be dissolved? Paul says we know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle was dissolved, meaning to die, God has us covered. Because of the sin of Adam, our bodies deteriorate now and eventually die. And this is why the flesh is good for nothing but to die spiritually. But God has prepared for us a heavenly body that will last eternity. Question three asks, how does Paul show that he was sure of God's promises? Paul was so sure about the promises that he spoke in the present tense. When our hand is in God's hands and we have been covered by the blood of Christ, we can be assured of God's promises that we will rise as Christ rose as well. This is the faith we place in the assurance that as God raised Christ from the dead and as we place our complete faith in him, he will rise all those who belong to him as well. The point of verse 1 is everything that is associated with the earthly life is temporary. We should not just invest in our physical bodies, which are temporary. We should invest in our spiritual destination, where our heavenly bodies will reside for eternity. As we invest in it now, we have the assurance if we are in the family. The first verse gives the believer the assurance that everything is going to work out for our good because we love and are called according to his purpose. Our heavenly bodies and that eternal destination first are not made by man's hands. No, they're made by God. And secondly, we will reside with him in the presence of God. Why? Because then if God made it, no one has any say so over. Only he does. Verse 2 reads, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall be found naked. Paul had been beaten for spreading the gospel. And like many of us, our burdens are hard to bear. But what we experience in this life, like Paul, we'll find hope amid our groaning. We have hope that God will make a way out of no way that we will live with him for eternity. Question four says, what is Paul likely referring to when he talks about groaning? Our hope is that after we have run this race, when this life is over, when the trumpet sounds, we'll be called to be with our Lord. And in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be put on our heavenly bodies. Paul says we desire to be clothed, referring to when we want nothing more to be with our Lord. Notice Paul said it comes from heaven. We cannot buy it. It has already been purchased for us. All we can do is receive this free gift from God. 
The word if makes it conditional. He says, if we be clothed. As believers, we long to be with our Lord, and to be with him, we must be clothed. This goes with Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding feast. At the end of the parable, we see an interaction between a king and a man who was not dressed properly. He ordered the servants to bind the man and throw him into the darkness where he will have a weeping and gnashing of teeth. This man who is not clothed represents those who are not properly clothed by God because they were not committed to Christ. So we must be clothed properly and not found naked. And naked here in this verse means guilty. This nakedness here is referring to all those who are not going to the judgment seat of Christ. Those who are naked will go before the great white throne judgment. These two great judgments are different. One is for believers and one is for unbelievers. And those who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior will come under the judgment or their salvation, but will escape condemnation. And in this, we'll have to give an account for how we lived as Christians. And this is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, those who have rejected Jesus Christ as Savior will face a different judgment, and this will be the judgment of condemnation, ending in the lake of fire, which is the great white throne judgment. The Bible talks about these in the end for believers, that believers will be rewarded, and we will get to that place where we will be rewarded for the things that we have done in this here body. To God be the glory. Verse 4 says, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that which would be unclothed, but clothed upon the morality might be swallowed up of life. In verse 4, Paul points out we have hope in a new life. So question 5 says, what longing does our groaning express? We long to be free. We want to be freed from the bondage of this flesh. We want to have on our heavenly bodies. We want to put on that incorruptibility. We want to take our corruption and put on incorruption in that resurrected body, so that we could be with Jesus Christ. It's almost like we're want to. we longing for version 2.0. See, in version 2.0, we have no more crying, no more dying, no more lying. See, 2.0 lasts for eternity. See, the point is the suffering of this life causes God's people to long for their eternal home. Paul is expressing that while we yet live in this body, we groan. Why? Because believers believe something is missing. Our soul desires to be with our God. We desire eternity. We desire that version 2.0. Those who are not saved desire to stay in version 1. In version 1.0, it's designed to live a life right now because right now gratifies the flesh, whereas 2.0 desires to live a heavenly lifestyle because we desire to be with God in heaven in our new bodies. So as a result, we groan. We groan because we're so sure that our immortality, our immortal lives is going to be so much better than our mortal ones. And this is why we want to be clothed in a new body. As we get ready to make a transition now, we're going to see the second pericope talks about walking by faith. Let's read verse 5 and, and begin to dissect it. Now he that have wrought us for the self-same thing is God, who also have given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. We see here a guarantee from God. And question six, what does God give us a guarantee for our future hope? God has also given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of his promise. See, the point is the Holy Spirit gives us the hope for eternal life in heaven. Question seven, what is the earnest payment then? An earnest is a pledge, usually money that guarantees the terms of a contract. The earnest money that God gave was his son. He gave his son as the earnest one so that we might have the blessed hope of eternal life. As you look at John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If you look at that, that was the earnest money to save whosoever would believe in him so they could have eternal life. And this is how Christ paid the ransom of our sin debt. Now God gives us the Holy Spirit to ensure us that God will complete the work of salvation that he began in our lives as stated in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Verse 6, it says, Therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in their body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Paul shows here the joy in God. As we see here, we walk meaning we live or make a habit of living by faith, not by sight. Paul is showing us they so truly believe the gospel, including their own resurrection and eternal satisfaction, that the struggle facing them are not as as important 
They, they don't have a concern about what they're going through right now. So question eight, well, what was the basis of Paul's confidence? He had placed his hope in the Lord. We can rest assured as we put our faith in Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, Paul shows that we are to have that same courage. He's shown us that they had courage to continue to press on. When we are convinced that our eternal destination is with God, we too can live that great courage, a life of boldness and of courage to do the work God calls us to do. Our eternity is with God, and no one can take that from us. Everything that matters spiritually has been and will be given to us. We experience the promise as a guarantee of certainty. We are confident that all Christ did for us on the Christ settled the debt. God loved us so much that he gave himself. He incarnated himself in his son to save us. Aren't you glad we have a God who loves us that will never leave us nor forsake us? He did what he did to save us. Question 9 asks, does being in our bodies mean that the Lord is not with us? No, Christ is Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. He has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. He says, lo, I'm with you always. He left us the comfort of which is the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, to intercede for us, to seal us into the family. A born-again person is never apart from God. We always have God living on the inside. See, God has prepared us to suffer for him now and to be glorified with him later. You can find that in Romans 8 and 30. It will happen, brothers and sisters. The spirit who dwells in us is the promise of God. It is the the stamp of approval that we will inherit heaven and be raised to immortality with Christ in heaven. Therefore, we can have courage while on this earth, no matter what we face, because of the certainty that we will live with Christ after death. While we were yet on this earth, our mortal bodies, were absent from the Lord in person. We look forward to the day that we will be able to walk by that faith. As we walk by faith day by day, we believe that the day will come that we will be able to see our Heavenly Father with our own eyes. It is better to be absent from this mortal body to be present with the Lord. This will happen someday as Christ will return for his family. To God be the glory. Verse 8 says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. We see it's more important for a child of God to be with God rather than against God. Nothing can satisfy us like being in his presence. This is how we're able to go through hard times, because we know nothing can keep us from the love of God. So we press on so we can be with him. We press our way to be near Jesus. As the text says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for eternity. See, the point is our hope in Christ frees us from the fear of death. No, we don't fear death. No, we're confident, as Paul says, that someday we'll be with God. See, that same faith, though it gives him courage, he knows that his eternal fate is secure, and that gives him a fearlessness to keep going in this life doing the work that God called him to do. The Lord knows that this old building keeps on leaning, And someday, brothers and sisters, we got to move. Our last outline deals with the pleasing of the Lord. Let's read verse 9 and find out. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted unto him. Paul here is simply aiming to please Christ. The point is, whether we live or die, our aim should be glorified the Lord. We are aiming to please our heavenly Father. We do it all for his glory, for his honor. We seek to put a smile on his face and not our own. Verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he have done, whether it be good or bad. Here, brothers and sisters, we see that word judgment seat of Christ that we talked about earlier. And question 10 says, What is the judgment seat of Christ and who will appear before it? Paul reminds us that believers will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, which means we will be judged for the way we have lived as Christians. See, the point is, our work for the Lord will be tested and rewarded. Whether we are on this earth or in heaven, it must be the ambition of each and every believer, and their purpose is to please God. We will worship Him forever and eternity in our new home, so we should do it even now in a world that is not our home. Every believer will be judged by Christ and His judgment seat. The unbelievers will go to the great white throne of judgment at which point Christ will sentence them to hell for failing to repent and put their faith in him while on earth. You can find this in Revelations 20, verses 12 through 15. 
But believers will get rewarded based upon their level of faithfulness and the purity of their hearts and motives. motives. And you can find this in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15. What is done by the power of God and not by our own strength will bring rewards. Some will receive many, some will receive few. Some will just barely get in by the grace of God. All of us will walk the streets paved with gold. And as we walk the streets, we will sing unto Zion, who will praise his name and glorify his name. To God be the glory. Well, that ends our lesson this week. I hope you've enjoyed it. If so, please leave us a comment and a thumbs up. I pray that you enjoy the rest of your day. Mothers, you have a special day today. We pray that God would just really bless each and every mother in this day and time. Well, that's all for this week. Come back next week. Same time, same channel. Be blessed now.